Hi, thank you, Maury. Um, Dolores Bach, our uh, head of R&D, was supposed to be making this presentation, uh, so you're getting the B team here. But um, what, what happened is, uh, as a CBER regulated company, we had a surprise FDA inspection um, a few weeks back. And when that happens, you really you know, have to drop everything and mobilize. Um, but a funny thing happened. At, at about day four of the inspection, America closed for business. So, um, you know, we, I don't know if any of you know Zarina Pitkin, our head of quality, but she's a tough Russian lady. And we thought, wow, that's an impressive way to get out of an inspection. But, but the, 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 the awkward point in time that we're at right now is that as soon as America opens for business, the inspection starts again. And so Dolores couldn't leave, and they're sort of in this uh, FDA inspection readiness status. So, uh, so I'll do my best. I've presented on organogenesis before, so that, that part's not too tough. But Dolores wanted a special focus on quality by design, which is a little tougher, but, uh, but, but we'll get through it. So to, uh, to begin with, we are a full-service regenerative medicine company. And uh, we span the value chain. We've built up the infrastructure to go from applied research through full scale up manufacturing to uh, successful uh, commercialization. I guess some of the metrics, we've shipped about 600,000 units of Aplograph, our cell-based product for wound healing. Uh, to do that, we have a couple hundred what we call tissue regeneration specialist sales reps across the, the country. And uh, I mentioned earlier this morning, we ship about 100,000 units per year now. So that's a big challenge in terms of manufacturing. In fact, we, we're, it, it takes about three weeks to grow the product, but it's applied somewhere in the U.S. to a patient Monday to Friday every 60 seconds. So you can imagine the logistical complexity associated with that. And we design and develop next generation technologies. I, I won't go through all of our milestones along the way, but... Life for organogenesis began at MIT. Our founder was a professor at MIT, Eugene Bell, in the 1980s, incorporated. Aplograph was the first allogeneic cell therapy to be approved by CDRH, FDA, in 1998 for the first indication venous leg ulcers, followed by diabetic foot ulcers. And uh, an another milestone worthy of remark is in 2012, we got our first CBER regulated cell therapy, Gentuit, for oral soft tissue regeneration. So we've gradually been building up the company, uh, a rather conservative model. We haven't gone to outside sources for capital, no venture, or, pr or private equity. So as the revenues increase, we gradually invested in the infrastructure and in building a more competent sales and marketing team, reinvesting and having a gradually more longer-term focus in R&D and uh, some of the operational improvements that are required. So this is just a simple cartoon. Uh, allogeneic cells are what we focus on. We have FDA-approved cell banks of keratinocytes, fibroblasts, epidermal stem cells. We withdraw the cells from the bank to grow the three-dimensional tissue. And we focus in two areas, wound healing and oral soft tissue regeneration, which seems a bit incongruent in terms of call points, and it is, but really the, the biological underpinnings of what we're asking the cells and the matrix to do is very comparable, to induce site-specific soft tissue to regenerate, whether it's the foot, the calf, or the oral cavity. Now, so what, what uh, we really want to talk about, and this is sort of our story, is we've gradually been trying to build our professionalism, our infrastructure, our way of working over time. And one thing that we've spent a lot of energy on uh, over the last few years is endorsing the concept of, of quality by design, the, the idea of identifying critical process parameters and just improving the way we design and develop products in order to de-risk them, first of all, but really ensure product quality, safety, and efficacy. So I guess the, uh, you know, the, there's a lot of reasons to do this. And you know, as I mentioned, we're, right, we're in the middle of an FDA inspection right now. The language that the FDA inspector uses is quality by design language. The questions that they're asking, the way they expect the data to be presented to them. So there is an expectation from, from FDA. And um, I, I do think that the ICH guidelines for pharma are something that is recognized and endorsed by CBER. So it's coming out as well, whether we like it or not from the regulatory front. But I think one example that I'll share is it's not just something that we should or have to do. If we look at some of our recent product development examples, um, over the last 10 months, we completed nine scientific design of experiments 
to identify six critical process parameters out of a list of 29. And uh, I guess our, our feeling is that if we had done that with a conventional normal way, it probably, we'd still be at it, first of all, and it would probably take an additional 10 months at, at least. And so I think that there's an efficiency that, that is coupled with the de-risking and the regulatory onus to do it. So I think that the, the only debate that we have is how do we implement it in a pragmatic way, in a, in a practical way. And, and for us, that's a debate that involves all of the departments in the company. And uh, I, I have a slide on each of them, but just to say that this isn't just an endeavor that's limited to our research and development team, is that we are trying to roll out the quality by design principles and philosophy across the company. So one place that it really began was our transition from a CDRH regulated company to a CBER regulated company. And the catalyst for that initially was the development of Gentuit, our cell therapy for oral surgery. Um, so our interest in QBD was, was perhaps sparked by that. But prior to that, in a CDRH device world, we had design control, and we followed design control. Um, right now, we're adherent to CDRH principles and to CBER principles, and so we've had to take the QBD uh, concepts that are not present in design control and incorporate them into our quality systems. So th this is the worksheet of our QBD implementation. And I guess the, the first thing is really you just need the endorsement of the executive team, of, of top management in the company, because we all know that change of any kind is difficult. And when you imagine just how rigid the protocols, the SOPs are in a company, um, it, it takes a huge commitment to migrate from one way of working to a different way of working. And obviously when you're a company that's at the commercial stage, any changes you make is like working on an airplane while it's in flight. So it, it's very difficult to actually incorporate these things while you're still getting, getting product out the door and you don't want to slow down everything, anything in the transition. So um, we, we've basically, I, I, the way I would characterize where we are now is maybe in the fourth box where we're trying to formalize the quality systems and we're trying to identify what are the gaps in our quality systems and if there are gaps that QBD is not adequately represented to have a debate and to think how relevant, how necessary is that, and how rigorous does this have to be. So the, the example, the, the best example that I could think of of this is the knowledge space. And a lot, a lot of these concepts are absolutely intuitive and they even existed in design control. So what is different? What is different is the scientific approach and the rigor and the data management. So the, the knowledge space in QBD is something that we, we really didn't do anywhere nearly as, as professionally or thoroughly as QBD calls for, and that's really where, where we are right now. So about halfway through the process of integrating this throughout our company. And then re related to this, but, but really a big shift for us is the utilization of very rigorously developed and designed preclinical work to guide development. And um, I guess the shift that I would describe at Organogenesis is we began life as an MIT company and almost, you know, as a religion, we were trying to reverse engineer skin. So we began with skin as the design goal, and we, we made our technologies look like skin. We incorporated two different cell types, epidermis, dermis, impact, basement membrane. So it was pretty obvious that, that, you know, it was a reverse engineering exercise. And thankfully, the technology worked. But where we're trying to migrate is away from that thinking and take a more agnostic approach where we're basically saying, that what we want to do is invest heavy, heavy resources, energy uh, in, des in designing the best large animal preclinical models that are very reflective of human immune systems and, and reactions to cellular constructs. And for that, we've partnered with David Sachs' lab at Harvard over uh, many, many years. And I think today we have the, those preclinical models that allow us to step away from trying to reverse engineer skin and to say, we want to look at any permutation combination of different cell types, different seeding densities, different types of extracellular matrices, and just let the science, let the data take us where it will take us. And so for our design of next generation technologies, we're not trying to reverse engineer anything. We're trying to invest in very predictive models and then let, let the data speak for itself. And this, this is an example of the, the large animal porcine model. So obviously there's a huge onus 
in, first of all, banking like pig cells and like subspecies pig cells, and then regrowing the constructs to be analogous with the same types of release criteria as, uh, as the human skin constructs, and then just testing them. And testing them not just in terms of wounds and wound closure, but what's happening from an immunological perspective. Now, the other, the other uh, interesting implication of quality by design is what does it mean to manufacturing? And, and the key thing is that if you've done a very rigorous job outlining your design space and outlining what are your critical process parameters, it makes things like uh, process changes very feasible. And, and actually, it enhances the success of the process change at FDA because you're generating the type of data that they want, but also for scale up and for automation and for closing systems, all of the things that are very, very critical for us to do, the quality by design is, is the approach that gives us the confidence that when we, we are making these process changes towards more and more automation and less and less human intervention, that we're gonna have the confidence that we've de-risked it and that it will be regulatory approved as process change, but also that, that it will continue to work like the original process. And uh, that, that's important to us because we are in the process of changing facilities. And, um, you know, whether you go from one facility that's 100 meters away, like we're doing, or whether it's the other side of the country, it's still, it's still a new manufacturing facility. And if we're going from a manual process to an automated process, this type of data and any change that we make has to be very, very well characterized, well understood. So we are really only migrating 100 meters away, but it's a very, very significant change for us. And uh, we're going from 150 Dan Road to 275 Dan Road, but we're also going from a manual process to an automated process and from facilities that in initially began life as CDRH regulated to both CBER and EMA regulated. So um, a, a lot of work is required and a lot of data needs to be generated. And then the last thing that I'd say about quality by design is um, that the Alliance of Regenerative Medicine has identified it as something that we can really work on together because these are principles that exist. It's a well-traveled path in the world of biologics, but how it gets operationalized in the field of cell therapies, in the field of regenerative medicine, is something that's very pertinent and relevant to all of us. So the Science and Technology Committee within the Alliance is trying to grapple with this and work this out and to deliver to us a, a pragmatic path that we can take. And it will be sort of a la carte, but it will be guidelines for how to implement quality by design uh, mechanisms, procedures, philosophy, and culture within a regenerative medicine company. So that, that's really all that I wanted to say. Or organogenesis uh, tries to get product out the door every day and our our passion is to change the standard of care primarily for wound healing but now also for oral soft tissue regeneration. So thank you very much.